In previous tutorials, we've determined the color of a pixel as the relationship of light intensity and a base color. For example, in one of the previous tutorials, we had a diffuse color of dark gray and a specular color of red. In this tutorial, we're still going to use those lighting equations that we learned, but we're going to combine that with the concept of texture mapping. So what is texture mapping? Well, that's when you apply an image, also known as a texture, to geometry. Now realize that image data doesn't have to be 2D, in other words, it doesn't have to be rectangular. It could also be 3D or volumetric, such as a CAT scan or an ultrasound. Now why do we have texture mapping? Because it's going to add realism to the scene. So to pull this off, we're now going to have to associate extra data with our vertex. So previously we had a 3D position, which was X, Y, and Z, and that was three floats. We also had a normal, which had an X, Y, and Z, and that was three floats. And in some of the previous examples, we actually manually applied a color to a vertex for an additional four floats, but that's not really how it's done. So now we're going to add something called a UV coordinate, which is also called a texture coordinate, and this is going to be two additional floats. And those UV coordinates are actually going to go by the names S and T. All right, so here's the problem. I have this texture that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and I want to apply it to the geometry that you see on the right hand of your screen. So how are we going to do this? Well, initially, we might try this approach where we do a one-to-one -one mapping, where we take the lower left part of the texture and we apply it to the lower left part of the geometry. Now here, the coordinate system that you see for this texture, 0, 0 means the bottom left and 1, 1 means the upper right. And if you look at the polygon on the right side of the screen, you can see that we've taken that coordinate system and mapped it onto the geometry. In other words, these are going to be our texture coordinates. So the nice thing is that the end result of this operation is that we've applied this texture to the geometry. Another nice feature that we get for free is that these texture coordinates are linearly interpolated for each pixel. And therefore you can think of it that for every pixel that we have to render, it has some kind of mapping back to the original texture. Now, what if the polygon is stretched? Well, you can imagine that because we do have that one-to-one -one mapping, the texture in this case is going to be stretched as well. So then there's the question of what do we do if we change the texture coordinates on the polygon? In this case, you can see that we've doubled the texture coordinates. Well, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but we've actually replicated this texture multiple times. Now, in this case, you can see that we get four mini textures on the inside of this polygon. And the question is why? Well, if you look at the point that's halfway between 0, 0 and 2, 0, clearly this is 1, 0. And because of that, that point is going to map back to the lower right-hand side of the original texture. Now, realize that this is just one way that we can handle texture coordinates that are outside the range of 0 to 1. There are other ways as well. So those examples are fine because they're relatively straightforward, but how would we generate something like this? In other words, how do we take a 2D image and apply it to 3D geometry that's not flat? Well, you can imagine that we might try to take an Earth texture like you see here and apply it to a sphere. To be able to do that, we're essentially going to map all of those pixels at the top of this image to the North Pole. Similarly, we're going to map all of the pixels that you see at the bottom of this texture to the South Pole. We could also map all of the pixels that are in the middle row of that texture to the equator. When we do something like that, we get the effect that we're looking for, but realize that in this case at least, that the texture has been stretched so that it fits the geometry a little bit nicer. All right, so in the real world, an artist is going to make a model and it's going to come with geometry and normals and UV coordinates, and it's also going to come with a texture. Because that's the case, in addition to the positions and normals for each vertex, we're going to have to load the UVs onto that buffer as well. Also, somehow we have to load that texture from file and put it into a buffer, and we also have to somehow get that texture to the fragment shader. So there's always a question of which image file we should be using. The one that we're going to use here is going to be a bitmap, and there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, bitmaps are really common, and they usually aren't compressed, so we don't have to worry about any compression algorithms. Bitmaps also contain a really simple header, which is just meta information about the image, which is followed by pixel data. Bitmaps are in BGR format, which is really close to the RGB format that we need. And they're also pretty easy to work with. In fact, I would recommend that you just use my bitmap loader. Now the question is, well, if they're not compressed, won't that be inefficient? And the answer is no. Realize that the compression is on the file side, not on the graphics card. So essentially what we would have to do is to uncompress that file and then send raw pixel data over to the buffer anyway. Now you may be asking about JPEGs and Targas, and in those cases you'll have to write your own loader. Another option that you might want to look into is using raw image data, and you can generate this kind of data with programs like IrfanView. Let's take a look at how we would do this in OpenGL. Well, the first thing that we're going to need are a couple more IDs. 
we would need an ID for the texture buffer that we're going to put the image data into. And then we would also need two additional IDs for variables that exist inside the shader. In this case, we'll have IDs text chord ID and also text ID. We also need a place to store the actual image data in our OpenGL program. So in this case, notice that we have an array of GL unsigned bytes called image. And image is actually going to be a three-dimensional array. It's going to have a width, it's going to have a height, and in its third dimension, it's going to have red, green, and blue components. We're also going to have to push the texture coordinates into the buffer. So in this case, we'll have an array of GL floats called UVs. And we'll also have to turn texture mapping on, so we'll do this through GL enable. All right, now that we've declared our variables, we need to take a look at some other code. The first thing is this GL gen textures, and this works similar to what we've seen before. It's going to return us an ID of a buffer. Immediately after that, we're going to call GL bind texture, and essentially this is how we're binding that buffer. And notice that we're passing it this constant GL texture 2D. Now the third line of code here is a little bit confusing because it has so many options, but let's go ahead and walk through it. Now the first parameter, at least for this class, you can assume is always going to be GL texture 2D. We could have also passed it something like GL texture 3D if we had that kind of data. The second parameter is at what level of MIP mapping this texture is going to be used for. And we'll talk about MIP mapping a little bit later. For now, you can assume that this is always going to be zero. The third thing that we pass is how internally OpenGL should store this data. So there's a lot of different options here that I'm not going to get into, but you can see a couple of examples down at the bottom of the screen. All right, the next two things that we're going to pass are going to be the width and the height of the texture, but notice that I never have to pass the size like we did when we were creating a vertex buffer. The reason for this is because it can determine the size of the buffer that it needs based on the other information that we're passing. The next thing that we pass has always been a little bit screwy to me. It's the width of a border if you want one. For this class, you can assume that we never really want a border around our textures. The next two things that we pass are going to be the format of the image data that we're about to put into the buffer. In this case, we're passing GLBGR, and that's because we're working with bitmap information. And then notice that we're also passing GL unsigned byte. Finally, the last thing that we pass is the raw image data itself. Now, one other thing that we need to talk about before we continue is the concept of a texture unit. This is simply a piece of hardware that has access to a texture image, but it's easy to forget about this. One thing to keep in mind is that even though we're using an image to determine the final color of a pixel, we're also going to be using images in a wide variety of ways to give us different kinds of effects. So for now, let's think of this GL Texture 0 as being the texture that's going to be used for the pixel's base color. Later on, we'll get into GL Texture 1 and GL Texture 2, but for now, we're just going to stick with GL Texture 0. All right, so we've already hinted at one approach on how we might handle texture coordinates that are outside the range of 0 to 1. Now, we can specify to OpenGL how we want it to handle that situation by calling this GL Text Parameter F. Now we have several different things that we can pass to this function. You can see a couple of them listed here, but notice how we call this function. We pass it GL texture 2D, followed by which dimension of that texture coordinate we want it to affect, in this case, the S coordinate. And then finally, we pass it one of these options like you see here. All right, so visually, what's the result of these options? Well, here we've got this polygon with texture coordinates 0, 0 in the bottom left and 1, 1 in the upper right. And you can see for the most part, we have this one-to-one -one mapping. In this case, we've changed that upper right-hand UV coordinate from 1, 1 to 4, 4. And if we had used the GL repeat option, you'd get something like you see right here. In this case, it almost looks like we've replicated the texture 16 times. Now, if we kept those same texture coordinates and we passed it GL clamp, you'd get something like you see right here. Now, I've personally never really had a use for this option, but it's still there if you need it. Now, in this example, I've kept the same UV coordinates, but I've used a combination of both GL clamp and GL repeat. Now, what do I mean by using a combination of these two? Remember, we can specify the behavior of S and T separately. So in this case, I set the S option to be GL clamp and the T component to be GL repeat. And it gives us an effect that almost looks like a flag. Yet another option that we have is GL clamp to border. And this would be good to use if you wanted to stamp this image on part of the geometry. One other option that's really useful is this GL mirrored repeat. Now you'll see two different images here. One of them is GL mirrored repeat and the other one is just GL repeat. Now I've put these ovals here on the screen to point out the difference. So what we're doing when we use GL mirrored repeat is that we're repeatedly taking the mirror image of the texture and using it to create a seamless texture that covers the entire geometry. So this is a really handy option when you have a giant plane that needs to be textured with something like grass or dirt. 
Another thing that we need to talk about with regard to texture mapping is the problem of minification and magnification. Now realize that at some depth and some angle we have a perfect match. We have one screen pixel to one texel, and a texel is just another name for a texture element. However, as we get closer to that geometry, we're going to have several screen pixels for only a handful of texels, and that situation is called magnification. Now conversely, the further away from that geometry we get, we're going to have several texels for only a few screen pixels. And we call that problem minification. So a basic problem is, what do you do if you have one screen pixel that's in between multiple texels? Another question that we have to answer is, what do you do if you have several parts of the image mapped to the same pixel? Well, the solution to this is we have to pick between GL nearest and GL linear. So here's an example of what it would look like to use GL nearest. In this case, the original texture was only an 8x8 checkerboard, and therefore when we go through the interpolation process, a pixel is going to determine its color by its closest mapping inside that texture. Now that's significantly different than this geolinear option. In this case, a pixel is going to determine its final color by how closely it maps to the center of a texel. In other words, if the pixel doesn't exactly map to the center of a texel, it's going to be the linear interpolation between the surrounding texels. So in this case, you can see that we have a smoothed out version compared to GL nearest. All right, another option that we have is called MIP mapping, and this is when we're going to have several textures that are pre-rendered. Now you can see an example of what this looks like in the image below, and I got this from Wikipedia, but essentially what happens is you take the original texture and you create a texture that's half the size of the original. After that you create something that's a quarter of the size of the original texture, and then an eighth and a sixteenth and so on. And all of that stuff gets combined into one image like you see here. Now the benefit of this is that OpenGL is going to pick the most appropriate one. So as we get closer to the geometry, it's going to pick the highest resolution texture, and as the object gets further and further away, it ultimately picks the smallest one. Now most of this is covered up by OpenGL, but what you need to remember is to call GL Generate MipMap. Alright, now diving into the shader, we're going to be working with something called a sampler. And we have several different versions of this. We have sampler 1D, sampler 2D, and sampler 3D, depending on the kind of image data that we're working with. Now you should note that samplers are going to be marked as uniform, which makes sense, because that texture is going to be shared across all the different pixels. Now to be able to set that texture as GL Texture Unit 0, notice the code that we have here. The first thing that we do is grab that texture variable using GL Get Uniform Location, and then to actually set that texture as GL Texture Unit 0, we call GL Uniform 1i, passing it the texture ID and then also the number 0. So looking at the code as a whole, you can see that in this first chunk we're actually loading the image data onto a buffer, and in the second chunk we're setting those options for how we're supposed to handle UV coordinates that are outside the range of 0 and 1, as well as how we want OpenGL to handle minification and magnification. What I really wanted to point out were the next three lines past that, and this was just a reminder that we still have to get that texture coordinate to the shader. Now to do that it's going to be similar to what we've seen in the past, we're still going to call this GL get a trib location, and this is how we're going to get the ID of that variable s underscore v text chord inside the shader. Immediately after that we turn that variable on, and in the next line down we tell that variable where it can find the UV coordinates inside the vertex buffer. Also notice that when we're calling this function we're passing it the value 2 for the second parameter. And the reason for this is because remember texture coordinates have two parts. Alright, now looking at a simplified vertex shader, you can see that we have two new variables here. We have s underscore v texture coordinate, which is the texture coordinate from OpenGL, and then we also have an interpolated version of that that's going out to the fragment shader called TextCord. So the vertex shader code for texture mapping is relatively straightforward because we just do a simple assignment. Now in our fragment shader, that interpolated texture coordinate comes into this variable TextCord, and this is also where we finally get to see the texture variable. To be able to access that texture, we're going to call this function texture2d, passing it the texture as well as the texture coordinate. Essentially what's happening here is that we're using that texture exclusively to determine the final color of the pixel. Now normally you don't do it that way, instead you would multiply that color by the intensity of the light that's hitting that pixel. Alright, so that's it. Hopefully you now understand a little bit more about texture mapping.